Hello, MagicCon Philadelphia. <laughs> I'm your host, Blake Rasmussen, for this first look at March of the Machine, but I'm not the one you're here to see today. Today, we have three very special guests, three of the brilliant minds behind March of the Machine. We have Emily Tang, Roy Graham, and Dave Humphreys, who are here to tell you all the things that we can share today about March of the Machine. Uh, but before we get to that, let's learn a little bit about our panelists. Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your role in March of the Machine. Uh, hi, I'm Emily Tang. I am the world building lead for March of the Machine. Um, I'm responsible for the creative uh, direction of the set. Hi, I'm Roy Graham. Uh, I'm story lead on Magic, uh, and I was responsible for helping put together the epic story you guys are going to get to read in a couple months. I'm Dave Humphreys. I was a set design lead, so I inherited the set from Vision Design. Um, I'm most focused on connecting with all the other teams. I, I own the file until it gets handed off to editing, work with the uh, play design and creative to make sure the whole set comes together. Yeah. So uh, if you don't know what March of the Machine is, it is our next standard legal release. So a couple important dates coming up. Uh, it releases globally April 21st, uh, the debut, where you're going to get even more preview cards will come on March 29th. And April 14th will kick off the pre-releases. Um, now, March of the Machine, we, we've all been waiting internally for this. I know you all have been as well, because this really is, Emily, the, the culmination of a lot of what we've been doing lately. Right. And so this set is it's a bit different from normal sets. It's uh, what we call an event set. Um, it's where we focus on an event that's taking place rather than uh, a world or a plane, like normal sets. Um, the last event set we did was War of the Spark, which was this giant epic planeswalker war all taking place on Ravnica. Um, focus was on planeswalkers there. This time, the focus is on planes. Uh, it's the Phyrexian invasion. They are trying to take over the entire multiverse. Um, so we just go across like all the planes of the multiverse. Uh, oh, seeing how they fight back. Um, so one of the one of the challenges with doing that was uh, trying to make it feel like an invasion across all these sets. Because you know, like we're going all over the place. It can look really jumbled. Um, so what we did was we came up with these things that we call markers of the invasion, um, like uh, the lands that we're showing right now. These, they have these. Um, this is this is sort of like stage one of the invasion, where the Phyrexian, in <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Phyrexian invasion tree realm breaker is. It's still reaching across the blind eternities. It hasn't gotten to a plane yet, but you're starting to see this, this Phyrexian symbol appear throughout the environment. It's appearing in the skies, in the architecture, in flocks of birds. <laughs> uh, it's sort of this like visual foreshadowing of what is to come. Uh, and there are, and as, as, I mean, as the invasion progresses, you see like you see these visuals grow more and more dangerous, more and more action packed. Uh, and it's just a way to let us jump across multiple planes, but still keep the feel of them as all being part of the same set. They're all facing the same invasion. Yeah, and we're going to see the phases of the invasion throughout this entire panel. Um, now, Roy was referring to the story earlier. So the story fans out there, that's going to kick off March 16th. Now, we're not going to tell you what happens in the story, but Roy, can you take us up to that point? Sure, yeah. Uh, and like you said, can't really talk about uh, what's coming. I don't want to spoil the twists we'll, we'll and turns get some, of the story. There'll be some tidbits. I, maybe you can trick some out of me later. But maybe. For now, I, I can, what I can do is I can walk you through where we've been uh, and uh, give you a, a quick rundown of where we're maybe headed. Mm. Uh, so obviously, this is a story that has its roots uh, as far back as you know, 1994 in the Antiquities block when the Phyrexians first get introduced. Uh, but uh, you know, cut several decades of storytelling later, uh, our story team starts picking up the pieces in Kaldheim to tell this epic conclusion to the story. Uh, so we see Vornklex, the first uh, off-world praetor on Kaldheim, uh, 
on a mission from Elish Norn uh, to get his hands on the sap of the world tree, the you know vast tree that connects the various realms of Kaldheim. Uh, next, we see uh, Jin Kataxius, also off-world on Kamigawa, doing experiments on the Kami of the plane. Uh, Experiments which lead to the ability to complete uh, planeswalkers that still maintain their spark, something I know the Vorthos cast were talking about in good detail before. Um, on New Capenna, we see uh, Urabrask uh, looking into Halo, a sort of mysterious substance which is uh, anathematic to Phyrexians and, and can slow down Phyresis, uh, some, uh, something that might prove uh, instrumental uh, if the Phyrexians mean to truly conquer the whole multiverse. Uh, and then on Dominaria, we saw Shieldred uh, return to uh, do her best to preemptively prepare Phyrexia's uh, ancient enemy, uh, the plane of Dominaria, uh, for invasion, uh, destroying uh, any artifacts that might uh, prove uh, impactful against the Phyrexian threats, such as the Silex and kidnapping Karn. Uh, now, obviously, heroes are not going to take this lying down. In the Brothers' War, we saw them go back in time uh, or project to Fairy's soul back in time. It's a little, little more complicated than uh, little that. Bit. A little bit. Uh, to try and determine the Silex's uh, firing mechanism, uh, something that they, they succeeded, although they lost to ferry to the time stream in the process. Uh, also complicated. <laughs> uh, and in All Will Be One, we saw uh, Jace lead a strike team of planeswalkers to the very heart of New Phyrexia uh, to try and detonate the Silex in Elish Norn's domain. And they fail. Now, we, we've talked a bit about the locations. We saw the beautiful art that the fans oohed and awed about. But um, as we look around the, the multiverse, Emily, are we going to see characters we've known before? Yeah, I mean, this is um, the, the invasion is this multiverse wide thing, but it's also about the people of who, who live in this multiverse and how they're affected by the invasion. Um, we see people get Phyrexianized. Uh, for example, Ayara. For example, yeah. Yeah, Ayara, who's the queen of Lockthane. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who's the queen the of Lockthane on like Eldraine. <laughs> yeah, oh, get ready. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, I just want to say that artlet is amazing. Yeah, it's like, great. Um, but yeah, she's, yeah, she gets Phyrexianized by... Um, the Furnace Host, the red-aligned faction of Phyrexia, of the Phyrexian invasion. Um, but I mean, it's also, it's not just about the people who get Phyrexianized too. It's about, even, even if you're not, even, even if you haven't been touched by Phyrexia, there's still like this emotional toll that you have to live through, you're, where you have to like fight against the people you once knew, your friends, your family. Um, right, these planes aren't going to be the same after they're right. hit by Phyrexia. Yeah. And nor are the people fighting those battles. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, as, as Emily mentioned, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of terrible changes that the Phyrexians have already uh, wreaked on the multiverse. Uh, our heroes failed, uh, and some of them became the same biomechanical nightmares that they were fighting. And there's, are, some, there's some emotions going on here. There are some big emotions happening, yeah, yeah. Uh, our, our heroes are going to have to confront uh, some serious consequences in this story. Yep. All right, so that takes us to the story thus far and some of the emotional impact. Do you all want to see some preview cards? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Let's take a look at our first preview card. This is Jin Gitaxius and the Great Synthesis. This is a legendary creature, Phyrexian Praetor. Jin Gitaxius costs three, two blue, five, five for a ward two. Whenever you cast a non creature spell with mana value three or greater, draw a card. My favorite three words in the game. <laughs> 
Three and a blue, exile Jin Gataxius, then return it to the battlefield transformed under its owner's control. Activate only as a sorcery, and only if you have seven or more cards in hand. And then it becomes the Great Synthesis. The first step, draw cards equal to the number of cards in your hand. You have no maximum hand size for as long as you control the Great Synthesis. And then two, return all non-Phyrexian creatures to their owner's hands. And three, you may cast any number of spells from your hand without paying their mana cost. Exile the Great Synthesis then return it to the battlefield. Dave, what is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> Chaos in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we, we, I feel like we had a tough act to follow. Like, I think we'd done a great job rolling out the Praetors from Kaldheim forward. I hope, hope you like those all, um, as well as original ones where we, you sort of saw that they'd uh, enhance your effects, diminish your opponent's effects. We felt like we needed to take a new look at them here. Um, some, someone had pitched, well, like, how about they transform into sagas? I have a long history of designing sets with sagas, having done Dominaria and Kaldheim and Neon Dynasty as the set leads for those. So sort of had a weak spot for that, a, an affinity for sagas, and it sounded like a cool idea that, they, that, in a way, this would sort of almost be like akin to an ultimate that a Planeswalker would have, that, like, if they stay out there and do their thing, they can act their, their ultimate plan, their ultimate vision, their ultimate scheme. Um, so yeah, it worked a lot with both play design and casual des play, play design to find the right balance of what would be like if, if you have this out and you're drawing cards every turn, things are going well, do you really want to give up that face for something? It's got to be really good and spectacular. So we, we wanted to really push the saga side of these to do like, if you've done this, like you're probably going to win. There's a chance you don't. It might could get disenchanted, but um, <laughs> And, and yeah, so you know, you're maybe drawing from seven to 14 cards, you're bouncing all the resistance, you're casting your whole hand. There's a chance that's maybe not enough, so then you can get to go back to the front side, we decided. But. All right, and uh, sagas are, are known for telling great stories. So Emily, what's the story these are trying to tell? Well, okay, that's pretty interesting because most before sagas have always been like in-world artistic representations of that plane's lore. Um, Phyrexia doesn't really have art. So the approach we took for this instead was just like, well, what is this, fr this faction of Phyrexia's, this Praetor's vision of a perfect completed multiverse? Um, and that's the, that's the idea behind the sagas. Uh, Jin Cataxius, for example, his is the Great Synthesis, which is the ultimate uh, vision of perfection through experimentation. Um, as for the art, uh, his idea of a great piece of art is this ultimate surgical completion bay that can fully and thoroughly complete anything and anyone in the multiverse. All right. Well, let's take a look at our next preview card, which shows how the story is just, it's sewn into this set. So this is Breach the Multiverse, a sorcery for five black black. Each player mills 10 cards. For each player, choose a creature or planeswalker card in that player's graveyard. Put those cards onto the battlefield under your control. Then each creature you control becomes a Phyrexian in addition to its other types. Uh, so, Roy, talk a little bit about this in the story. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I love this card uh, not only for being like this big, splashy, powerful, cool effect, but uh, also for the, the narrative expression of... Uh, what we know in the story is, is happening uh, not only on the planes that we see, and, and in the story we, we go you know, to the ground level on a lot of planes, uh, which I think is really exciting, uh, both in the card set and the story. Uh, but canonically, this is happening everywhere, right? The Phyrexians are going everywhere. Nowhere is safe. Nowhere is safe, exactly. And so the, the, the way that this uh, card tells that story through mechanics is, I think, so cool. Yeah. So we've seen earlier one character get completed. We're going to see more, including our next character, Heliod, the Radiant <laughs> John. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Heliod, the Radiant Dawn, on the front side, two white and a white for a legendary enchantment creature god. If you guys like this one, we've got so much more. Uh, <laughs> 
4-4 when Heliod the Radiant Dawn enters the battlefield. Return target enchantment card that isn't a god from your graveyard to your hand. Three and a Phyrexian blue mana. Transform Heliod the Radiant Dawn. Activate only as a sorcery. Turns into Heliod the Warped Eclipse. You may cast spells as though they had flash. Note that it's a Phyrexian god. Spells you cast cost one less to cast for each card your opponents have drawn this turn. Dave, what is going on here? Right, so a lot of this is wanting to show an expression of things going from the, uh, a way you're familiar with them. We, uh, trust me, we have like a lot of just cool like, oh, I wonder what that would look like, Phyrexian. We, we hit a lot of, lot of cool stuff. Um, and also just to show like, the, you know, what's at stake here. There's a lot of very powerful characters uh, being transformed. Uh, we, we wanted to show that, uh, we, we thought it would be fun to use Phyrexian mana to show that where um, they're, they're all taking on, on their, uh, the transforming DFC, they're becoming and we're able to show art for them in their Phyrexian form. Um, they're, they're all trying to do a little bit of uh, color pie bending um, to take on some aspects of the, the Phyrexian mana color that um, is being used to transform them. The front side, we always like, again, we're trying to highlight all the planes from the multiverse. We really want the each card front to speak really well to its its original plane. So here we're speaking to Theros, so calling back to enchantments. Um, the, the little extra god text is just because it's not so fun if you play this and they kill it and you play another one and it gets it back. But um, and, and then also on the, the reverse side, like a number of cards we try to make callbacks um, visually or mechanically to some iconic Phyrexian creatures. So this um, is supposed to be a little bit of a reference to Consecrated Sphinx um, in terms of, like, I guess some, you can sort of tell in some of the artwork and just also mechanically and in tying into carrying how many, about how many cards your opponent has uh, drawn in a turn. Yeah, and what, what kind of story is this trying to tell, Emily? Well, so we had a lot of fun um, with Phyrexianizing people. <laughs> <laughs> we so there are we we have a number of uh, major planes that we focus on in the set, and for each one of those major planes, we try to figure out like, oh, how would they fight back, and how would Phyrexia uh, tailor the invasion to them? Um, for example, like I don't know, Ikoria. If you go to Ikoria, which has some of the biggest monsters in the multiverse. How do you want to? How do you want to go about it? Obviously, you send the biggest Phyrexian juggernauts you have to just duke it out. Um, so Theros was a pretty interesting one because if you're if you want to take over Theros, you want to you want to take over the most powerful creatures on this plane. Those are the gods, but because of the nature of faith on this plane, you. It's, you can't really just grab a god, stick them inside a surgical completion bay, and then have a Phyrexian. Uh, the gods are shaped by the belief of, um, the faith and belief of their devotees. So what they did instead was, uh, with Ajani's help, um, they sort of went about it in a different way. They focused on completing the gods' uh, believers, and then as more and more believers became Phyrexians, their belief in the gods became warped to be this like Phyrexian way of thinking. And then once it reached its critical tipping point, then the gods became Phyrexians as well. All right. Uh, the next card we're going to show, it's a pretty simple card, but it gives me chills kind of every time I look at it. Uh, so we're going to start with the flavor text when we reveal it. So this is Moment of Truth. On the precipice of eternity, Elspeth made a choice. The fight would not end without her. He chills again. Uh, so it is a one and a blue for an instant. Look at the top three cards of your library. Put one of those cards into your hand, one on the graveyard and one on the bottom of your library. Roy, what, what is going on here? Blake, you know I can't tell you that. <laughs> but you know what I can say is the last time we saw Elspeth, uh, she was walking into the Blind Eternities with the Silex uh, to keep it from going off and uh, damaging or destroying every plane connected to Realm Breaker, the Invasion Tree, which, you know, as we've been talking about, is a hell of a lot of planes. Uh, she made a huge sacrifice in doing that. Um, but as for whether that means she's out of the fight that's coming, 
I'll, uh, I'll leave to you all to find <laughs> out. We will see. So um, now we've talked a bit about the, the focus on the multiverse and, and how we're making this a multiverse spanning conflict. Uh, Emily, how, how are we seeding that throughout the set? So uh, I, I, touched on it, uh, bleh, I touched on it a little before. We have these major planes that we're focusing on, but we, like, we're going to see Dominaria, obviously. We're going to see Ravnica, some really big names. Uh, but it's, it's not a multiverse. It's not an invasion of the multiverse if we don't see a huge range of planes, as many as we can. So we're going to, as, so we're, we're hitting on like all the planes we can. We're going to some uh, places that we haven't seen for a while, um, like Lorwyn Shadowmoor. <laughs> we, get to, we get to see how all the elves, the Kithkins, all of them fight back. We get to see, um, I'm trying to remember the order. Tarkir. Tarkir. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we get to see how the dragons fight against their Phyrexianized kin, these giant aerial battles. We get to go to Alara. All, all the armies of Alara fighting back against the Phyrexians. Um, and then we go, we go even more obscure than that. Some places that you know we haven't ever really fleshed out or explored, but they still show up. They're still part of the multiverse. I love that we're going to Chandelar. That, yes. I, yeah. We go to Chandelar um, or places like Mercadia. Even. Yeah. There are. There you guys are like Mer planes. Mercadia? <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of planes to pull from here. So. So I mean, that's kind of what's going on at the macro level, at like this plane plane level. Um, mm -hmm. We also want to bring it. We also wanted to bring it down to the micro level and focus on the individuals, though. So one way, like like the people who are fighting, and how they uniquely protect their planes. Um, one way we're doing that is with something that's pretty new that we're calling team ups. Yeah, we've got some unexpected allies, which brings us to our next preview card. This is Drana and Linvala. For one white, white, and a black, you get a legendary creature, Vampire Angel. They are a 3-4 with Flying and Vigilance. Activated abilities of creatures your opponents control can't be activated. Drana and Linvala has all activated abilities of all creatures your opponents control. You may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to activate those abilities. Uh, Dave, tell us what's going on on this card. All right. So yeah, like these these team up cards were just hugely popular in internally. I think we started with maybe a handful, and then every every playtest we did, people were like, "These are my favorite thing. We need to make more of them." So we, we keep added adding more and more of the set. I kept going back, talking with Emily, like figuring out how to get all the color pairs involved, all the many color pair trios involved. Um, yeah, so we, like, with the goal of all these, again, I, I think they speak for themselves a little bit. It's kind of a fun pairing of, like, often unlikely allies or just kind of cool allies um, that, right, in, in each case, we wanted to really hit home at least one of the characters and maybe find a twist on that character. Sometimes they're just pure mashups of characters, as you'll get to see here. Um, right, so w with this card, we started kind of the, the starting point was the Linvala from Rise of Eldrazi, which is like that, that first main ability there. Um, was like looking for a twist, like Dr Drana didn't necessarily have any mechanics that directly spoke to that that I felt like made, made any clear sense, but that like in many ways, in many cases, we've seen like that black might steal abilities on some pretty popular iconic cards and that that felt like the good twist. Not only can they not use them, that you can use them instead just felt like a really good m match. And then, you know, we put on vigilance so that it could still attack and use those abilities. And we're just pretty happy with the overall package of uh, this pairing. It's such a uh, great like buddy cop pairing, also vampire mm -hmm. angel. Right. <laughs> yeah, yep. like for, yeah, for each of the for each of the teammates, we tried to play into like, oh, what's something fun we can do with these two? Is like, do they have like clashing personalities, or it's like, uh, is it just a fun contrast, or do they have some unique fighting styles that go together well? Right. And, and this this one really is again kind of more of a twist, but in, and again, a lot of those end up looking more elegant. Um, and certainly, we were mindful of word count, which. Speaking, speaking of word count, we're going to do a little <laughs> flavor text theater on this. Roy, are you with me? Oh, yeah. I got you. All right. I'm going to take the first part of this. But uh, next up, we have Yargul and Multani. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll start with the flavor text. 
I've heard much about you from my daughter, Multani rumbled. I'm pretty sure that's how Multani sounds. Uh, there was a time when I'd balk at your aid, Phantom, but she has shown me the merit of Urborg's strange ways. <laughs> Replied Yargle. That's the official <laughs> pronunciation, yeah. Can I just say, my favorite flavor text in the entire <laughs> set. Yeah, this, this is, there's some great flavor text in the set. This is definitely up there. Uh, Dave, we've obviously got a vanilla legend here, but the reaction. Yeah, this one was pretty hard to resist for a lot of reasons. Uh, like, Isamaro was not available for this team up. We felt like Multani is kind of mostly, in many ways, about stats. So it felt like a good, a good partnership here for, uh, yeah, just doubling up on stats. Uh, some fun numbers. It's some fun stuff. We actually had a lot of fun playtesting this card with trying to figure out how to get the, the extra damage you might need to do cool stuff. So. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at our next preview card, which if you saw this art on Twitter, then you're going to recognize this. But we're going to show you what it does. It's Thalia and the Gitrog Monster <laughs> teaming up at last. One it's white, a black, fun. and a green for a legendary creature, Human Frog Horror. 4-4 four, four with first strike and death touch. You may play an additional land on each of your turns. Creatures and non-basic lands your opponents control enter the battlefield tapped. When Thalia the Gitrog monster attacks, sacrifice a creature or land, then draw a card. First, Emily, first, tell us about the story of these two buddies teaming up. What can I say? She's riding a giant frog horror. <laughs> uh, they're just going to gallop out, and they're going to skewer all the Phyrexians they can. It's amazing. The, ty okay. the type lines in this set are fantastic. They, they really are. Yeah, absolutely. Human frog horror. Uh, Dave, tell us about the design of this card. Right, so yeah, th this one's very much a mashup, um, right? We, we have the Eldritch Moon uh, Thalia, perhaps a lesser known version of Thalia, but um, in, in, in terms of like the, the, some of the effects in terms of slowing down creatures and non-basic lands. Um, and then, yeah, we, we wanted to then just bring in like some of the, the land facilitating munchings, I don't know, just lands coming and going of Gitrog and card advantage um, that people love the first time. We also got the nice little pairing up of mechanics here of uh, First Strike and Death Touch, which is really powerful and fun, even though we got scooped a little bit by Glissa. So. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, for our next preview cards, so these, these are some commons, but um, you know, we've talked a bit about the invasion tree opening portals throughout the multiverse, uh, kind of no matter how innocuous. And this shows another stage of the, the invasion, correct, Emily? Right. So, like, the basic lands we saw earlier were stage one of the invasion. Um, these, the, these dual lands are more of, like, stage five. Uh, we're, it's, we're towards the end stage here. Uh, the Phyrexians, the, the invasion tree has broken through. The Phyrexians have poured onto the plane. They're all over the place now. This, uh, there are, there are like these rivers of glistening oil everywhere. Mm -hmm. the sky's this really ugly, angry red. Uh, it's just not a good place to be right now. Like you come to this plane, you see this, you immediately go, "Oh no, I shouldn't be here." Yeah. Um, but you. Where else are you going to go everywhere it looks like this now? No, it, it looks pretty bad, but our next preview card does tell us there is some hope. In fact, there's Chandra, Hope's Beacon. Four red red for a legendary Planeswalker Chandra with five loyalty. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, copy it. You may choose new targets for the copy. This ability triggers only once each turn. Add two loyalty, add two mana of any combination of colors, plus one exile the top five cards of your library until the end of your next turn. You may cast an instant or sorcery spell from among those exiled cards, and minus X, Chandra Hope's Beacon deals X damage to each of up to two target creatures. So Dave, tell us a bit about Chandra. Right, so the, the starting point for this Planeswalker and a lot of our Planeswalkers is trying to understand, well, like, well what have we not tried to deliver on recently? Like, we, we put out a Jaya and a Koth and a lower uh, mana value Chandra as well. Um, we felt like this was, this was a time to try for a really big um, top end finisher type of Planeswalker. Um, we, were, we were, you know, I felt like we've also done a lot of Chandras. Making Chandra designs is actually quite hard to feel, feel novel. 
Um, I thought a really good starting point would be to work with a, a non-loyalty ability. So we, we pretty quickly latched on to this um, ability to copy spells. That felt like a pretty exciting and over-the-top thing to do. Um, from there, we kind of we kind of worked from there. Well, like if if you're going to play this, you're not going to probably be able to cast a spell right away unless we give you mana. So the one ability can give you mana to maybe cast a removal spell or cast a card drawing sort of spell. Um, you know, if if that's not something you have in your hand, then you could be setting up for the next turn with a plus one. Um, if you, if you really just you know want need to stabilize the board or whatnot, um, you can you can opt for the minus X here. Of again, again, it's kind of I, I like the idea that like there's copying a spell, you, but you can also like kind of send out two two forks of damage as well um, to help stabilize the board. So it's a very versatile, powerful end game card. Yeah. Also, the least spoilery planeswalker we could show you. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Dave, we just came off a set which had tens plane, plane wa ten planeswalkers. Very focused on planeswalkers. Uh, how many are in this set? Well, as I think you know, it's a little bit hard to answer how many planeswalkers there are on the set. But there, there are not. There are not ten. There are, there are much fewer than ten. There are, I would say, at least three planeswalkers, and then it's debatable. And then, and then we'll see. Yeah. All right. At least three, but less than ten. Yeah. All right. Okay. Next, we are going to talk about the booster fun in this set. We're going to take a little breather from blowing your minds with preview cards uh, and show some of the cards we've already shown in their uh, special treatments. So we are going to start off with the borderless and extended versions of Chandra and Breach the Multiverse. So these are versions we've seen before, the full art borderless planeswalkers and the extended art rares and mythics. Uh, so that's kind of par for the course, but uh, the the next bit of booster fun we have, uh, Emily, are the planar borders. Tell us what's going on here. So we what we did was we actually did a, a, a oh yeah, that's, separate. That's Jinga Taxi. <laughs> Jinga Taxi is, uh, one, yep. uh, I skipped a part. This is the uh, borderless Praetors. Those come out as well. That is not the planar borders. The planar borders are next. The planar borders are, uh, we have a unique treatment for uh, all our different, all our major planes. Because mm -hmm. um, like, when, when, when else are we going to get a chance to blow, out, blow it out like this? Yeah. Uh, it's, there's a lot of, we're bringing back a lot of treatments from previous sets. Um, like. For example, the Phyrexians, they get this Ikori treatment that debuted in All Will Be One. Um, for Theros cards, we're bringing back the Constellation treatment that came from Theros Beyond Death. Mm -hmm. uh, for Dominaria, we have the Stained Glass treatment <laughs> again. Yeah. Um, and for like Innistrad, we have the Equinox frame from Midnight Hunt. Um, we also we also did end up creating some new treatments for planes that didn't have booster fun before, uh, which I do I think we do get to see one later. Right? We do get to see one later. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that that new that new look. So this is uh, basically it's the same um, slot I guess for lack of a better term in boosters, but it always focuses on what plane the characters are from, correct? Right, it's, and it, that's another way to like show, showcase like the planes of the multiverse. Yep, absolutely. Uh, now, Dave, we have another um, uh, cool slot, I guess we'll call it, the Multiversal Legends slot in Boosters. Tell us about the Multiversal Legends. Right, so this, I if you've played Strixhaven or Brothers War, you'd be, like, the, the Strixhaven uh, Mystical Archive or the Brothers War Retro Artifacts um, had, a, had a slot that you would be part of your draft experience. It, it didn't affect legality. If a card shows up here and it's not currently in standard, it's now not suddenly in standard, you'll, you'll be thankful for that probably when you see some <laughs> of these cards. But, uh, right, so, yeah, it, it's just, it's an added experience. Like, I thought, I think we felt like what, I think we're always looking for opportunities now for like what might we do for a bonus sheet? Does one make sense here? Like you know, we we really wanted to show like you know who would be some of the coolest characters fighting in this this battle, either for the Phyrexians or for for the Resistance, as it were. Um, like what what are some some of the most popular legendary creatures that we could show um, fighting this battle? Mm -hmm. For example.
I, I don't think I said explicitly. So these are all reprints. These are all reprints in the Multiversal Legends slot. So um, there are going to be four different treatments for these Multiversal Legends. There's the regular, which you're seeing up here. There's foil etched, halo foil, which we will show more as we get closer to the set. And then these will come in serialized as well. Soak that in for a second. Yes, you could open Ragavan <laughs> or, uh, in your March of the Machine pack. Uh, okay, next, I know people want to know about the Commander release that happens alongside this set. So uh, tell us a bit about what we've got going on. We've got five decks in this Commander five release, correct? Five decks, yeah. Um, right, so yeah, the, the five decks themes are mainly what I'll tell you here now. Is so the, we have a white-black Phyrexians deck, a white-blue-black Knights deck, a red, green, white, um, plus one, plus one counters deck, a red, blue, white, uh, convoke deck, and a green, blue, red, uh, artifact tokens deck. Yeah, and now the eagle-eyed among you might notice that red text at the top that mentions the word plane chase. Dave, what is going on there? <laughs> <laughs> Right, so Plane Chase, um, we, we haven't made new Plane Chase content in, I believe, 11 years. Um, we felt like, hey, this is a celebration of the multiverse. What better time to bring back a, a popular format people have been asking to see new content for than, than Plane Chase, which is, which is all about, right, you, you bring a deck of plane cards. So we have, we have new plane cards as well as, as reprints, what we'll get to, um, right? So just to explain the format a little bit more again. So yeah, you, you have a deck of uh, planar cards or they're oversized cards. Um, they, they kind of set new rules for your, your experience a lot. You know, this gets played a lot casually in multiplayer. You have this, this first um, paragraph is like, right, while, while this plane is out, um, these, are, these are the kind of the new rules of the game a little bit. Um, each turn a player can roll a planar die one of the faces um, will send you to a new plane. One of the faces is a, it results in chaos, um, which is this last chaos ability at the bottom there. Um, four of the faces, you just stay where you are, but then you can, you, can, you can spend mana to roll the dice more. And it's just, yeah, it's a really fun way to familiarize yourself with all, all, all you know, all, like planes walking through our multiverse, experience our multiverse. Um, yeah, it's just, I, I think, a perfect match for this setting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there, there, and then as well, there, there is a uh, reprint phenomenon that comes with each of these decks. So it's fi five new planes, four reprint planes, and one phenomenon. Um, so ten, ten planar cards with each of the decks. Yep. And it's ten different for each deck, right? Ten different. Yeah. All, ten different for each deck. All right. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about the promos you can get playing March of the Machine. Uh, we're going to start with some that you've seen before. So uh, we've been running this 30th anniversary promotion uh, for about I don't know, six, eight months. Time is a construct. So if you play in a March of the Machine pre-release, you can get one of these. There's the Eternal Witness from 2004. Uh, that is a Portuguese Court of Calling from 2005. And then Niv-Mizzet, the Fire mind, a personal favorite of mine from 2006. Now, also, if you play in a pre-release, um, we have some promo cards that are that will come with pre-release kits. They are not part of the standard set, but they are part of the Commander Legality set. We've got some more mashups here. So uh, let's see those three cards. We're going to start with Goro Goro and Satoru. So this is one of our mashups. So uh, blue, black, and a red for a legendary creature, Human Goblin. Whenever one or more creatures you control that entered the battlefield this turn deal combat damage to a player, create a 5-5 red dragon spirit creature token with flying. And for one and a red creatures you control, gain haste until end of turn. Dave, tell us about this card. Right, so yeah, just in generally, uh, I will say that um, right, our, one of our product architects came to me and said, like, you know, we want something really special for this pre-release. We want some new content. Um, I felt like we, we still hadn't gotten to all the color combinations we wanted to, so this seemed like the perfect way to uh, finish up those. Um, some of these do end up being repre repeats from some of the planes, whereas most of the other ones in the main set are unique. Anyhow, uh, right, so this, this is again like Goro Goro was like a part of, part of um, its abilities were in creating dragon spirits and giving your creatures haste. Like the, the mechanical tie-in that I saw there, well, oh, if we, if we use a ninja or nin like tie-in to ninjutsu, um, 
in, in all cases, those could be creatures that are dealing uh, combat damage the turn they enter the battlefield, and sort of th that was the tie-in to kind of bring this card together. Where, right, if, if you can, if you're either using haste or ninjutsu, you can be getting five-five dragon um, dragons as your output. Yeah, and uh, again, these are you'll get one of these three, and we'll show the other two in a second. Uh, just for playing in a pre-release, they are not playable in the pre-release. That's true. Yeah, yeah, you don't have yeah. to face these every round of the pre-release. We're not we're not putting our <laughs> finger on the scale that much. All right, next up, uh, the fav my favorite of these three is Katilda and Lear. So Katilda and Lear is a three-three legendary creature, human, just one type on this one. Uh, green, white, and a blue. Whenever you cast a human spell, target instant or sorcery card in your graveyard gains flashback until end of turn. The flashback cost is equal to its mana cost. Dave. Right, so I mean, the, the elevator pitch here is pretty much all your humans become snapcaster mages. That seems pretty good starting point. But yeah, like Lyra, Lyra was about giving cards flashback. Uh, Katilda cared about humans. This seemed like it's a pretty, pretty easy one in terms of uh, bringing things together for design for us. Yeah. Uh, and the third one I know is going to be a fan favorite. Yep. Uh, this is Slimefoot and Squee together at last. For black, red, and a green, you get a legendary creature, Fungus Goblin, of course. A 3-3 three, three, whenever Slimefoot and Squee enters the battlefield or attacks, create a 1-1 one, one green Sapperling creature token. And for one black, a red, and a green, sacrifice a Sapperling, return Slimefoot and Squee, and up to one other target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, activate only as a sorcery. Dave. Right. So yeah, I, I, like a lot of this, I wanted to play up like both the, the immortality of Squee and the like you know lovable token generation of Slimefoot. Um, we, right, like basically so long as you can keep a Saperlene around, you can sort of keep things going. And, you know, I love, I love re stuff that returns cards from graveyards. This is sort of a pet card of mine. And yeah, like there's just a lot of f fun stuff you can be doing here. It encourages you to play other Saperlene cards. I, I love it. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have the bundle promo that will come with every bundle. Uh, it has a main set version as well. Uh, Golta and Mavrin. I'm going to read this, and then Emily, you're going you're gonna to tell us about this odd duck pairing. Uh, so for three green, green, white, white, you get a 12-12 legendary creature, dinosaur vampire with trample. Whenever you attack, choose one. Create a tapped and attacking XX green dinosaur creature token with trample, where X is the greatest power among other attacking creatures, or create X11 one, one white vampire creature tokens with lifelink, where X is the number of other attacking creatures. This is an odd pair, Emily. Yeah, I mean, you would never expect a vampire to be fighting alongside a dinosaur, but it's one of those situations where it's like, I guess we're allies now because we have a greater enemy. Um, and actually, <laughs> what I really love about this card is that uh, it's a 12-12, it's a which is the exact same power toughness as Galta's solo card. Because really, it's like you get this giant dinosaur just trampling in a battle. What's a, what's a vampire going to do? She's yeah. hanging on the side there. Uh, and we've got that middle card up. So it, this comes in the main set as well. You can get different versions of it. But talk to us a little bit about that middle version of Galta. Yeah, so, th so, that's a, so that's one of the new uh, treatments that we did um, for Ixalan. It's, we're calling it a treasure frame, I believe. And it's, it, we, see, we see the characters uh, stamped in gold. It's just like immortalized in a way for their actions during the invasion. All right, and Dave, tell us about the design of this card. Yeah, so I will say I think I think more time was spent talking about this card with casual play design than any other card in the set. There was a lot like there there were a lot, I had attachments to little things like I really wanted this to be a, like a twelve twelve at least a twelve twelve. Can we please not go smaller? And they're like, oh, you, like then it needs to cost eight mana, and then I'd keep reworking the abilities. And there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of discussion on this card. Um, yeah, like I, I'm still super excited with where it ended up. I mean, I, I did get the like we kept the twelve twelve trample. It's pretty impressive for a seven drop. I hear. Um, right, and especially with these abilities, right, that you, you have the flexibilities either in deck building or from game to game in terms of like, do you have a big creature? Do you have a bunch of creatures? You can build and play to optimize either. We've still got the reference to caring about the, the you know, caring about power of the creature. Um, 
which was important to the design, and then like bringing together also so that Mavern has a, has a role in terms of like Mavern's about token making, make, token making of vampires specifically, but why not dinosaurs here too? And then yeah, that there's there's definitely incentive where you can either ha add to your attacking force or just set up a hu huge army of lifelink uh, vampires to help protect you. All right, uh, I have in my notes now to pause for dramatic effect because. I think this card's going to get the biggest reaction. I think. We'll see. We've had some pretty good reactions so far. Uh, the Buy a Box promo, which also has a main set version, uh, is a character we've seen before. In fact, we've seen this character four times before. Once as a green creature. Once as a green and red creature. <laughs> once as a green, red, blue creature. And most recently as a green, red, blue, white creature. So, let's see the next incarnation of Omnath, <laughs> Locus of All. And there was excitement and then, oh, oh no, oh. <laughs> so, Omnath, lo Locus of All, for white, blue, a Phyrexian black mana, red and green. You get a legendary creature, Phyrexian Elemental. A 4-4. Four, four. If you would lose unspent mana, that mana becomes black instead. At the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, look at the top card of your library. You may reveal that card if it has three or more colored mana symbols in its mana cost. If you do, add three mana in any combination of its colors and put it into your hand. If you don't reveal it, put it into your hand. Uh, Dave, tell us about the genesis of this card. Right, so yeah, a, a number of people came to me asking for this. I think as soon as I mentioned to Emily, she's like, yeah, definitely do it. Um, it, it wasn't just me. A lot of people were excited <laughs> about this. They were like, we have to um, see it. So yeah, like, again, like in, in terms of like how we sorted out the design, I mean, like, I forget exactly when we landed on black Phyrexian mana. We knew we wanted to add black mana. I, I forget exactly when we came up with the idea. And then, you know, it, it occurred to us that it would look like that in the upper right-hand corner. And like, oh, that's just like aesthetically so perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, right, we, we also have, I mean, we've toyed a little bit with Phyrexian mana. Phyrexian mana is kind of dangerous in terms of balances, many of you know. Felt like we certainly could get away with that on this card. Um, I, I also like that that meant you could spend it, cast it for four mana, which is nice in comparison to some other five mana, um, five color commanders. Um, then, right, so then th then there's like, so the first line of text, like this is actually kind of an interesting thing in terms of playtesting where I think originally it just like saved all your mana turn to turn if you had like, you could have a one, one white, two red and a green. You'd need to track that turn to turn and people are like, this this is too hard. Like, I don't want to have to track all those colors turn to turn. And they're like, and then we like, well, how about we give, turn it all into black mana? And then just, again, that, that just felt like such a good, perfect match in terms of like, well, you otherwise might not have a lot of black cards in a commander deck, for, for example, because like you don't necessarily need to get black mana. And we, we also wanted you, and t wanted you to be b playing black cards and kind of celebrate that you have black mana and your Omnath also tied into just caring about mana. Like, I, I really wanted this card to, like, overall really care about mana because that sort of feels like the crux of the, of the the character to me, which then led us to the other part. Again, working a lot with casual play design. They're, they're like, five-color commander. Like, don't make it too ubiquitous and strong and just go in every deck. And, it, you know, like, right, that, that's that's not necessarily what the audience wants. So, like, I, tr I tried a lot of different designs. This, this is the one that stuck, and I'm really happy with it, which is, like, Caring about, um, caring about cards like what is the hook for this card? What makes this so that you choose fun and different and interesting other cards to put in your deck? Um, and, and this is certainly, I think, pretty a pretty new one, which is that, yeah, you, you have to have three colored mana pips on your card. So that could be three color cards. That could be, you know, Avacyn or whatever, you know, like, it, it, you know, monocolor cards, two color cards. But probably most of you have not done a search looking for cards that have, like, three colored mana symbols, um, you know, regardless of the combinations and that, right, I mean, it, you still get a card regardless, but if you get that card, it really helps you cast that card. All right. And, and Emily, when, when you and the, the throngs of people internally went to Dave and said, let's do this, uh, yep, those are the main set versions. Um, w where did the nugget of that idea come from? Um, I, okay, I, I honestly don't remember. It was someone else who came to me and was like, could we do this? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> so. And I did want to say, I, I have brought a commander deck um, with this as my commander and some other cards we've had on the preview show. So I'll be looking for games later. Yeah. 
He'll he'll have the deck and the where where are you gonna be? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. You gotta <laughs> <laughs> we'll say the command zone. Command zone, maybe. Or free play area. Yeah. So look for Dave if you want to play against Omnath Locus of all. All right. We are going to shift gears a little bit here, and we are going to talk about uh, the full product lineup for March of the Machine. So it's just going to be me that talks for a little bit. So let's throw the product lineup up on the screen. So it's fairly typical. Uh, we have set boosters and draft boosters. You feed the, see the five commander decks there. We've got the jumpstart boosters returning, pre-release pack, bundle, all the good stuff, collector boosters, all the normal stuff. Um, also alongside this, we will be doing some secret layer drops that are March of the Machine themed that we will take a look at here because even secret layer has not been spared from the invasion. So this is one of the drops that will be up for order in April as part of that super drop. Uh, these drops will come in Halo Foil. So we're going to show what the Halo Foil is as we get closer to that date. Um, all three drops are going to have five cards. So this says Volume 1. There will be three of these. Uh, each one will have five cards with different showcase treatments. So the five showcase treatments up here will not be repeated for the other two drops. Uh, so these are styled after either their home plane or in the case of Wheel and Deal, what if this was their home plane? Um, so yeah, we've got uh, Walking Ballista, Wheel and Deal, Questing Beast, Olivia Vildarin, and appropriately, the World Tree. So we will have more information on this drop and the other two March of the Machine drops as we get closer to April. Now, before we go, uh, we have talked a bit about a, uh, a, s a smaller set, a, a sort of odd duck that comes after March of the Machine that we're calling the Aftermath. And we've, we've been a little tight-lipped on this, but, but Roy, what is March of the Machine, the Aftermath? Uh, Aftermath is it's a narrative focused set uh, that you know uh, game design and, and story and world building all were uh, working together to make sure that we were uh, really putting the emphasis on uh, showing uh, the what Emily and I were talking about that you know the ultimate consequences mm -hmm. uh, that follow uh, the story of March of the Machine. Yeah, and it's going to be a fifty card set, so a smaller set. Five card boosters. It will be standard legal. Uh, we are going to kick off the story on May 1st. And then previews are just going to run two days, May 2nd and 3rd. Um, and then we do have a preview card from this set, but finding one was a challenge uh, to find something that didn't give, uh, I guess, too much away. Spoiler alert, this one gives stuff away, not much. It's it's like you said. It's the least spoilery the thing least we could find spoilery. in a in a set of about fifty spoilers. Yeah, <laughs> like uh, like this could happen. However, the war goes. But uh, so let's take a look at this card from Aftermath: the Kenrith's Royal Funeral. I know. Yeah, oh, I know. know. I feel your pain too. I know. Uh, two white and a black for a legendary enchantment. When the Kenrith's royal funeral enters the battlefield, exile up to two target legendary creature cards from your graveyard. You draw X cards and you lose X life, where X is the greatest mana value among cards exiled this way. Legendary spells you cast cost one less to cast for each card exiled with the Kenrith's royal funeral. Right, so I mean... Obviously, I can't say a lot about this card <laughs> uh, from a story perspective, but uh, we've been saying it the whole time. Uh, the story of March of the Machine is going to have serious repercussions for the multiverse. Yeah. Uh, and those ramifications are, are going to, you know, if, uh, if you hadn't guessed, continue on into the set that follows Aftermath, uh, Wild to Veldrain. Yeah. Yeah, this card will directly lead us into the next standard legal set. Okay, that covers all the preview cards we have for you today. Uh, we are going to leave you with a little bit more information, some important dates coming up. So as I said earlier, the story kicks off March 16th. Now, 16th through 27. Roy, that's a long time for story. What's going on it's here? It's a long time for story because we have a lot of story to get through. Uh, you know, we've been talking about this as the epic conclusion of a story years in the making. And we thought, you know, it would be 
it wouldn't be appropriate if we didn't kind of go all out. So mm -hmm. there are going to be uh, 10 main story episodes instead of just five, and eight side stories to accompany this. It's going to be awesome. There's going to be so much. You're going to get to see like your favorite authors from like many years of Magic story now. It's, it's going to be great. Yeah. Uh, March 29th, then, will be the set debut cinematic trailer and the uh, start of previews in earnest. Uh, card previews will run the 29th through April 4th, and then the card image gallery will be complete on April 5th. April 14th through 20th is when in-store pre-release events will be ongoing. The digital release for Magic the Gathering Arena and Magic Online will take place April 18th with the global release on April 21st. And then you can attend an in-store launch party event April 21st through the 23rd. Uh, if there's any information from today that you want to revisit or check out, uh, there will be an article on dailymtg.com accompanying this, as well as the video going up on YouTube. So, uh, yes. And, and if I could just say, uh, you can find the story when it goes live, starts going live on March 16th at mtgstory.com. Absolutely. Definitely Thank tune you. in there. So, Thank you all for joining us for this first look at Martian Machine. Thank you to Emily, Roy, and Dave. And have a good rest of MagicCon Philadelphia.